Hi, I'm Dan Olson, Facility Manager here at Plymouth Church. Um, and in this series, This Old Church, my co-host Dan Mowry and myself hope to introduce you to different areas of the building and different aspects of our jobs, which we find exciting, and hopefully you will too. In this episode, uh, we will be exploring the extensive renovation that we undertook in 2019 of the Rollins Tower. We will be meeting with our guest, Jimmy Peters, with OPN Architecture, who will be explaining to us the extensive engineering and uh, work that went into rehabbing this historic tower. I'm joined today by Jimmy Peters, architect at OPN. Um, I came to know Jimmy through the renovation of our tower here. Uh, Jimmy, would you tell us a little bit about what your involvement here was? Yeah, um, so in 2018 we came in and uh, um, the church alerted us to a couple leak points inside the building. Uh, here next to us we have uh, the tower that was um, drawn in 1926 and along with the sanctuary and the education wing. And um, together uh, they are a part of the campus. Now there are several buildings that make up campus. Um, some are older and some are newer. Um, and where the um, issues really occurred for the, us was right where those buildings meet. So where a new building meets the old building, uh, very difficult to connect buildings together. And that's what we focused in on a lot in this project. Now, Jimmy, this tower would have been built sometime in the 1930s, that's correct, right? Yep. Uh, the original sanctuary was built in 1926, and then the tower was built shortly after that, and these would have been the original, walls. original front doors. And if you just look at the girth of these things, um, <laughs> and, and, and how they were built and how they've held up for so many years. And you got the, the stone detailing and mortar joints that would have all been rated and performing as exterior walls at that time and now are interior walls. Right. And if you look up here at the ceiling, we have these holes on either side. And I believe this is what you're talking about where the, the, the building wasn't flashed properly um, with the original structure. Um, can you explain a little bit about what you found up there? Yeah, absolutely. So we had, uh, what we noticed was uh, basically um, a white uh, salt that would appear on the face of the brick. That gave us uh, some clues that there was moisture getting into the walls. Um, we were led up onto the roof to look at where these two structures connect because this corridor going down was built in the 70s and this tower was built almost 40 years beforehand. So we looked at where the two connect and what we found out is um, basically it was almost as if this hallway was glued to the face of the tower. Um, and what we uh, got to in the project was an actual connection where a piece of metal goes back into the tower wall and separates the two. So they're not just held together by a sealant joint that can fail and water can get in, but we've connected them a little more in in integrally. And if we come inside of the tower here, we notice that um, this water damage doesn't appear to be coming from that particular connection between the two buildings. So we had yep. bigger issues as yeah. well then, right? Yeah, yeah. This, this uh, really puzzled us for a while. Um, and um, the church commissioned us to do a report. Um, and uh, we finished the report um, in March of 2018. And what we did is we started looking at the different geometry that uh, this tower has. And the unique thing about this tower is uh, it's got buttresses on each corner that create um, structure to hold those corners up and span the height. And at each one of those buttresses, uh, a lot of water was able to sit on the surface of the brick. And um, so what we did was we treated it like um, a multi-story building. We started to cut this down into several layers where we could put in some metal flashing at key locations where stone is uh, acting as a separator between brick. And we put metal flashing in there to give the tower a ability to dry out. And that is kind of um, what we think was causing some of the water in these corners was the walls were just getting so wet that they weren't able to dry out. And that was stemming from the geometry of the buttresses. 
And I, I see you brought the report along too. You mind if we take a little look at that? Sure, yeah. Um, and I notice when I look at this, like the very front cover picture, um, I notice that you, it almost seems like you can see the metal rafters yeah. below the slate. Now, how did that <laughs> be like that? So the reason we're seeing the inside of the tower here, or the inside of the sanctuary here, is we had some scan points when we were uh, doing a 3D scan of the building um, that identified where the ceiling was in the sanctuary. You, we couldn't see the roof of the sanctuary because the scanner points couldn't see on top of the building. So it sort of goes invisible and you can see underneath. So Now what kind of a scanner would that be? This would be a, a Leica scanner that uh, sits on a tripod and uh, you walk out of the room, press a button, and it sends out an array uh, and captures data on each sends a laser to the wall, the laser comes back, and it tells it where that point is in space. And then we can recreate that digitally. And it almost looks like it's x-rays. That yeah, yeah, and you can see the color here too because it gets matched up with uh, photo photos to actually know what colors those points need to be. That's uh, really high tech. <laughs> um, and uh, the rest of the report that goes into detail about uh, what we need to do to make our repairs. Yep, this was the model we built. Um, so we built digitally a model based off the old drawings, and that's what we printed um, for the 3D structure as well. So, so you would take the original 1926 yep. Proudfoot drawings, and brick by brick, it would build uh, how they had it in their plans, is that correct? We would uh, basically build the digital model based on those plans and sections. And back in the uh, 1926, Proudford had like four sheets for this whole building. It was pretty incredible. <laughs> um, so they had one sheet that showed a tower section, elevation, details, all on one sheet. And we kind of used that to build and um, get a perfect representation of what that tower should have been. And that gave us a comparison for the 3D model then to look at and juxtapose to see what the differences are. So what you're seeing in some of these photos here is the 3D model, that's this green um, cast over the top of the uh, perfect model. And it shows where the tower wall was bulging out um, because there was a lot of water in the wall. And so the exterior wall would actually like bend outward. We can measure what that was. Um, in several places, we had up to four inches of a bulge because of the water issue. And so the need to kind of rethink the exterior of this um, was definitely there. So um, the water, you mentioned the water in the walls, and that's what attributed to this. That's what you found out later. Yeah. Uh, that the water was in the walls and traveling down through the walls and water does what water does and tries to find a way out and it's coming inside instead yeah. of getting outside. Yep. So then the solution to that would be to keep the water from getting in in the first place. Yep, we just tracked it back up through the source. Um, and the source in this case was we couldn't get the walls, which was an exterior load bearing brick wall to dry out fast enough. Right. So that acted like a sponge and water just kept pushing its way down um, because of gravity until we got down to the corner and it's got nowhere to go. And so it um, then causes a failure at the paint or the plaster layer. So uh, when we were going through this process, there were actually people that suggested that we get a price to remove the tower. And it came <laughs> back about the same as uh, rebuilding the tower so we opted to rebuild it and I think <laughs> we're grateful that we did and I think we're going to head upstairs and take a look at uh, some of your work. We were in a room below the music library and the music library is below us so the music library is actually part of the tower as well. Yep and the uh, roof to the entry is down now where we're just standing. Right. So this is all exterior. And you remember when we first came up here that this was yep. all uh Yep, so we have uh, four operable windows that we restored um, that can open and close here. Um, and we actually, part of this tower is encapsulated by the roof and stays a lot drier. So where we had water damage was the corners that were exposed out on the sides. Oh, really? Um, so, um, yeah, this would be like below here where we 
survey of the tower we started to notice um, some spalling some cracks that would happen in the stone tracery that makes these beautiful windows up um, and uh, a couple points right during when we were doing the survey um, uh, there was a stone that fell from this uh, south side down into onto the roof and it um, punctured the roof and we had to deal with that right away and take care of that and um, so we started to take a closer look at the windows here. And uh, the previous system was a, a metal grate similar to this one. It wasn't painted and um, it had anchors into the stone that was causing the stone to break apart. And so um, we uh, remedied that by pulling them all out. And when we did, um, there was a lot of loose stone that we had to re-put back together and then um, put these back on. But the, the big point of it was, is uh, we were trying to keep uh, stone from falling into the courtyard below. Um, and actually the courtyard had to be closed during the project, um, not just for construction activity, but because we were worried about stone falling from the tower. Right, um, and I'm looking out the window here and I noticed that these walls are really thick. How thick are these walls? Um, the, the walls here are um, about two feet thick um, and they jog in and out based on uh, as you go lower to the building, lower, lower to the grade, um, the buttresses get thicker and the uh, um, copings that the stone splits this into sections go wider and it gets to two foot four and three foot. Wow. So two foot is the nominal that kind of goes all the way up but it gets much thicker as you get closer to the bottom. And I noticed that these brick work is attractive as the ones on the outside. Is there a reason for that? Yeah, yeah. So um, there would be a, a building brick. Um, and when they fired bricks back in the day, um, the bricks that were closer to the heating elements um, would get darker and the bricks closer to the interior would be lighter. And so they came up with these different grades of brick and they only used the the grades that they wanted to on the exterior, leaving the common brick or the basic, the building, basic building brick uh, for some of these um, other applications like the interior of the bell tower. And, and then one thing that I remember, but I don't see any of it anymore because it's been repaired, was that there used to be brick that would have like two inch mortar gaps. Yeah. Like they had the wrong size brick. Yeah, yeah, there was um, uh, a, some, some repair campaigns that um, they use the wrong size brick. Today, the way we do brick, um, it's called a modular brick, and they're actually smaller than the traditional old style bricks. So um, that is what led to bigger mortar joints on some of the lower brick that ended up giving us some issues. Mortar isn't as water resilient as brick, um, and when you think about that many joints over a huge area, it just introduces another point for water. It's a lot more water being allowed into the wall system. The other thing is uh, there's a texture on the bricks 
the if you look on the outside of the building, uh -huh. there's a vertical scoring that occurs on the bricks. Right. And you can't see it on these because these are building bricks. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, th about three different colors. There's a, a red, um, a sort of buff color red, and then a black brick. And that black brick was um, the way they flashed it, it turns the color of the, the brick black on the outside and they use those as their headers. So we had to find matches for all three bricks with that same vertical scoring um, in order to fully match the restoration with the original project. How hard is it these days to find standards on that brick? Uh, it's pretty difficult. We, uh, we made a lot of phone calls um, to different um, brick plants and talked to about four different brick reps to find it out. Um, the, the modular bricks that were used um, had a different texture and it was kind of a, a spotty, uh, rough texture as opposed to the vertical clean lines that the old brick had. And it was smaller and so we just had to keep looking and uh, we found a, a plant that could do it and we got on their production order in time and uh, so that all worked out. So really we actually well. had to have brick made for this job. Yep, yep. Brick was made uh, particularly for this job. That they were set up at the plants to do it. Um, so uh, it wasn't a, a completely custom run, but it was a run for this job. Right. Yep. And I know that we have a future work plan, and we decided in advance that we would order extra of that yep. brick as well. So we are set for the future as well with that. Yep, we uh, ordered some attic stock that will uh, allow for future repairs. Wonderful. Well, let's head on up to the roof and take a look. All right, so uh, we're up here on the tower roof and uh, the, the tower roof got a whole new um, redo. Um, there's a new rubber roof on top of here. All of this stone had to be lifted up so we could get a metal flashing that went through both sides of the wall. That was to, to keep water out. And I remember the old flashing came about this high. Yeah. So you guys went with through flashing all the way through underneath the limestone cap. Yep, we pulled the roof all the way up and then we have a metal flashing that actually goes underneath the stone continuously and weeps out on the other side. So this element, which gets the most water, um, doesn't transmit that water down. It, it's cut at the metal flashing. Looks like you've added some weeps here as well. Yep, yep. We took all the um, care that you would normally see in a, in a masonry job to add weeps and vents and um, everything that we need to keep this uh, intact for the foreseeable future without as much maintenance. Um, what happened with the finials here? I know we had some different uh, issues we ran into with those. Yeah, so these stone finials had to come off to get this flashing in. And as we started getting into this, a lot of them had big cracks that uh, heaved apart the finial into uh, pieces and uh, would, um, would be a big concern in the future. And so uh, as we were working our way through this, we realized that the rods that connected them down into, there's a steel rod inside here that connects it to the lower stone. They were made of a ferrous steel that could rust. And so when those rust, they expand and it breaks the stone. Um, so they've been re since replaced with stainless steel that, that won't do that. Wow, that's amazing. Well, this is probably one of the most amazing views in the city of Des Moines, I would say. You see the capital down there. If we got any airplanes coming in, we'll be able to see them touching down over that way. Um, really an amazing place to be. 